people are blessed, that's separate. It's a, it's, it's a different cheshbon. It's a, it's a unique relationship that Hashem has with the Jewish people. And uh, being in solitude should remind us not only of the Eicha Yashva Badad, it should remind us also of the Hashem Badad Yanchenu. Being alone, one of the connotations, one of the insights of this aloneness is the special connection that Hashem has with the Jewish people. Now I have, I want to talk about Chai I want to talk about the Fabrengen, the topic of the Fabrengen. Um, I just want to say one thing about this virus. I, I've seen in the names of G'dayli Yisrael that you shouldn't even say the name of the illness, just like we call uh, you know what, Yenem Achla, you shouldn't even say the name because you don't want to give it any chayas, you don't want to acknowledge it as a presence. <coughs> even though our actions are acknowledging it as a presence, at least our words are going to act as though there is no such thing. So we don't identify it by its name. I just want to make one observation. I mean, nobody knows. Nobody knows what this means and what God's plans are. And um, only a Rebbe, only a Rebbe, a real Rebbe, true Rebbe, is in a position to interpret such an event, particularly if he's going to give a negative interpretation, if he's going to say that somehow this has something to do with a correction that we need to make. For you and I, we don't, we don't have the authority and the right to interpret events like these, and we certainly do not have the authority to interpret them in a negative way. Um, I heard the Rebbe once say to somebody once, you're not a prophet. Prophets were forced by God to say negative things about the Jewish people. You're no prophet. There's no reason why you should elect to speak ill of the Jewish people. It's your free will. You're not being forced. You might as well say something nice. And that's how I feel. I feel none of us are in a position to have an interpretation of this event about, quote, the, the sins that we need to correct. This is God's business, and we don't have to understand it. But there's one striking characteristic of this pandemic, which I, I think is historic, and that is that the children have been spared. Um, usually, whenever we have these kinds of illnesses, it affects the most vulnerable, and the most vulnerable are the old, the weak, and the very young. Here there's an illness that affects the old, it affects the, the people who are physically compromised. Unfortunately, it's very close to us. We all know exactly how personally we experienced the, the effects of this illness, but it doesn't touch children. Children can get sick, recover from this illness, and not even know they were sick. And this I think is historic. I think it's almost unprecedented. And I, I think perhaps there's a message in that, that God Almighty is announcing to the world that he's looking after the children. He's looking after the children uh, because the children are the most important thing. And um, if, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, if, if there's a lesson we want to learn, the lesson is God has preserved our children for us so that we should raise them to be God's children. You know, we always talk Shavuos time about this theme of Baneinu Ervin Ba'adeinu, that our children are our guarantors. This is a medrash which the Rebbe quoted many times, that when God Almighty wanted to give the title to the Jewish people, he asked for a guarantor. He asked that someone should take responsibility that it would be preserved, that it would be kept. So the Jewish people said, our parents, our parents will preserve it for us. And God Almighty said, that's not enough. So then they said, our righteous people and our prophets, and Hashem would not accept any offer of, uh, of Arvus, of a guarantor, until we said, Baneinu, Baneinu, our children are guarantors. And uh, of course, any person with half a brain understands that when we said to God, our children are guarantors, what we're really saying is that we are guaranteeing to raise our children that they should be the guarantors. And to me, this is what strikes me about this event that we're all experiencing. That's really, it's once in a century. It's all experiencing for the first time. Nobody has any experience in this. I think it's life-changing. I think when this is over, I'm going to be a different person than I was when this 
began, and I suspect that I'm not uh, alone in this. Hashem is saying, I'm looking after the children. I'm protecting the children. And the message for us is that we need to raise our children um, to be the guarantors that God Almighty preserved them to be. Anyway, this is just, I want, I really felt like it was important that I should at least touch on current events. And I want to move on to the date. Today is Chai Nissen. Today was the 18th day in the month of Nissen, <coughs> which is the birthday of the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levik. He was born in Tafresh Lamet Ches. That would mean uh, 1878, and now it's 2020. So that makes him 142 years old, I think, um, on the 18th day in the month of Nissen, Chai Nissen. And uh, 24 years later, on this day, our Rebbe had his bris. The Rebbe was born in Yudalaf Nissen, the 11th day of the month of Nissen. The Rebbe's bris was, of course, on time. Well, I shouldn't say, of course, it was on time. And the Rebbe's bris corresponded with the Rebbe's father's uh, birthday. So I want to do this backwards. I want to talk about the Rebbe first. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, Rebbe Leibig. Um, first of all, it's, it's a well-known story. I, I think it's very well-known, and it probably was disseminated on WhatsApps that reached the people I'm talking to, that the previous Rebbe said in Nasiche that in Russia in 1902, there was a terrible gzeda, a terrible decree that the government was contemplating. And right before Pesach, our penis is thus in this battle. And right before Pesach, miraculously, it was nullified. And the, there is another idea brought in the Sikhs that says that the birth of Tzadikim is Mavatal Gzedes. <coughs> I apologize. When a Tzadik is born, uh, it nullifies a decree. And, um, and the, the, the connection is obvious that the previous Rebbe said right before Pesach, when the Rebbe was born right before Pesach, there was a terrible decree by the Tsar, by the king of Russia, and then it was miraculously abolished. The Rebbe Rashab made a comment about God Lavaya. I, I don't remember it exactly, so I'm not going to misquote it. But in any case, the Rebbe was born Yud Aleph Nissen, and his bris was on Chai Nissen. Um, there's something that people don't know that I think is very important. And that is this, is, this is what I heard growing up. I heard it a very, very long time ago. That there's a photograph of the Rebbe right before his first haircut. There's a photograph of the Rebbe right before his Apsheranis where he is wearing the outfit of a sailor. And when we were growing up, we had that picture. And uh, later they found a better print of the picture and so on. But we heard as children that when the Rebbe saw the photo of himself, his mother, I think, carried it with her from Russia. <clears throat> when he saw the photo of himself in this sailor outfit, he tore it. He tore it in half, ripped it in half. And he was very upset that the photo was made public. And the reason he gave was that I wore a yarmulke from my bris. From the day that Rebbe's bris took place, he was constantly wearing a yarmulke. And it frustrated the Rebbe that in the photo, you don't see that he's wearing a yarmulke, which is why the Rebbe was upset about the dissemination of the picture. So the Rebbe's chinuch, I mean, when does chinuch begin, right? We know that chinuch begins before a baby is born. But on a practical level, the Rebbe's chinuch started from the time of his bris. The Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Tzinchana, uh, related much about the Rebbe's early years in a series of articles that came out in the Yiddish Haim um, in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And the Rebbe's mother said about the Rebbe, and is given a Kodesh Merachim She says, I'm a witness. She was his mother. <clears throat> that the Rebbe was, was holy from Rechem, from conception and from birth. He was a, a very unusual child, and he was raised in a very, very, very unusual way. Um, amongst the things that we know about the Rebbe's very, very early years is that on the day the Rebbe was born, the day the Rebbe was born, six telegrams were sent from Nikolaev, from Lubavitch to Nikolaev with instructions about how to raise the Rebbe. On the day our Rebbe was born, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitch, the Rebbe sent six telegrams to the Rebbe's parents with instructions about how they should raise him. Um, amongst the instructions that we know that the Rebbe's mother repeated was the instruction that she should never nurse him without washing her hands and without washing his hands. 
right? meaning to say that even if the baby woke up in the middle of the night and uh, was hungry, like all children are, and we all know what mothers do when, um, when uh, children wake up in the middle of the night and they're um, laying in bed, the Rebbe's mother was instructed to wash her own hands and to wash the little boy's hands every single time. Ritually. Her- you mean ritually. Wash your hands ritually, right? Natil Siadayim, yeah. Thank you for that. Wash your hands ritually in a holy way to, so that the child wouldn't eat with hands that were spiritually unclean. <clears throat> and she said she had two other sons. She did not get the same instruction for other children. She got this instruction only for her oldest son. And in a series of other instructions of this type, I mean, she said that uh, as a very young, as an infant, there was a Fabrengen once in her parents' home. I, you must understand that Ebbo was born in Nikolaev. That was born in a very, very Hasidic town, a Hasidic town. His grandfather, his mother's father, was the local Rav. His name was Rebbe Shleme Yanovsky. He was a giant of Torah and of Hasidus. And the Rebbe's parents lived with, with the Rebbe's mother's family for the first 11 years um, after they got married. And the Rebbe Levick was sitting and studying this whole time and so on. The Rebbe was born there. His brothers were born there. And his formative years, his earliest years, he was raised in what was really a very Hasidic environment. <clears throat> Pardon me. And there was often Fabrengans in the house. So there was an occasion once where there was a Fabrengan in the house. The Rebbe was a baby. And he was in a playpen. And when the minion got up to Davin, so he spoke, the, the, the evening service begins with Baruch. He's supposed to bend your head. So the Rebbe grabbed a hold of the side of the playpen. He pulled himself up and he bowed. He bowed. He may have been less than a year old. He was very, very young. And it was very clear that it was deliberate, that he knew what he was doing. And when the Rebbe's mother saw this, she ran in and pulled him out. She didn't want people to notice um, how outstanding the Rebbe was. There are many, many stories. There are many, many stories that I could tell you about the Rebbe's early years. But I think the most incredible, the real, there's a pretty amazing stories about the Rebbe's childhood. The Rebbe once jumped into the Black Sea. He was 11 years old. He jumped into the Black Sea to save a drowning boy. And the lifeguards couldn't save him. And the Rebbe was a boy. And he knew how to swim. You know, one of the things that the Gemara says, you're supposed to teach your children how to swim. You know that? One of the few things that the Torah mandates as part of Chinuch is you have to teach your children to swim so that if they're ever in the water, they can navigate. So the Rebbe was taught how to swim by his parents. His parents were religious Jews. <coughs> he jumped into the water and saved this little kid. And the Rebbe Tzanchana didn't even know who it was. There was just a rumor on the beach that a little boy had jumped in and saved the drowning child. And only later did she discover it was her son. But a story which is really extraordinary. It's completely extraordinary. And someone has told me that they actually have identified the very place in Nikolai where this event took place. The Rebbe was five or six. Five or six, five or six is very little. And there were pogroms, pogroms in many places. Russia, 1905, 1906, 1907, it was a very, very difficult time in Russia. Um, in, so, in Tsarist Russia, pogroms and anti Semitism were a politique. You know, when the government wanted to deflect the, the displeasure that the people felt towards the government, the lack of opportunity for work and the lack of opportunity to earn money and things of this sort, they would organize pogroms. So the, the, the prospective complainers were busy getting out their nerves on the Jewish community. This happened every 20 years in Russia. It was, was, it was institutional, institutional racism, and many, many Jews were killed. So in Nikolaev, there was a pogrom. And all of the mothers and the little boys and girls and the children were hidden away, I think, in the basement of a bakery. I, I may be wrong, but it, it was some kind of a shop. And they were hidden away in this basement. And it was very, very, very important that they should all be quiet. The Rebbe was a five-year-old. He was a five-year-old. And he walked around. And you can understand yourself that the mothers were in a panic. The mothers were hysterical. And if the mothers were hysterical, the children sensed this hysteria. The children sensed this hysteria. They expressed this hysteria like children do, which is that they cry. 
The Rebbe went from child to child. Was a, she was a little boy. He went from child to child, got their attention, got their attention, got them to focus on him, and he quieted them. It, it was a, a, an expression of a wisdom, not of an adult, but an incredibly astute, an incredibly mature adult in a five-year-old. The Rebbe had such a grasp of what was happening at that time. And he responded, he reacted, he did what needed to be done under the circumstances. I, I, to me, this is the most remarkable story of the Rebbe's childhood. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, when the Rebbe was seven, the family moved. They moved from Nikolaev, which was a very, very Hasidic environment, to a very, very big and what was then one of the most modern cities in Russia, especially as it related to Jewish people. They moved to the city of Yekaterinoslav, which was then called Yekaterinoslav, and now it's called Dnepr Petrov. It's on the Dnepr River, the Dnepr River. And the Rebbe's father became it off. So the Rebbe and his brothers went from living really in a very protective environment, in a very uh, insular environment, to being at the center of all of the upheaval that was happening in the world at large and the Jewish world in particular, um, in a place of a maximum upheaval. You know, when the Rebbe's father applied for the Rabonis, for the position of, the, of the being the Rav of Yekaterinoslav, there must have been 20 or 30 different factions. I mean, the Jews were split into a thousand isms, and each one wanted the Rav of their liking. And there was a huge, huge campaign, a very involved campaign where each community chose a Rav to their liking. The Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, was Moise Nefesh, worked very, very hard to see to it that the Rebbe's father would become the Rav of, of, of uh, Yekaterinoslav, of that city, the Nebbe Petrovsk. And to be candid, he gave him a job, and he obviously made a living, but I can assure you it was not a job that any normal human being would seek because the job was a virtual impossibility. The, the, the challenges of the job, the difficulties associated with this rabonis, to keep the whole community together, together to try and please everybody, to, to, um, to, to understand all the different factions and all different interests. And by the way, by no means were they all Orthodox. At that point, many of the Jews were no longer religious. Many of them were secular. And Rav had official power from the government at that time still. <clears throat> and first of all, as far as Rebbe Levick was concerned, Rebbe's parents, they were very young. They were in their early 30s. And they navigated this position with such sensitivity and wisdom and intelligence. Um, Rebbe Levick and Rebbe's, Rebbe's, Khan, Rebbe's, Khan, Rebbe's parents were incredibly endearing people. They were just likable. And they spoke the language of every person. The Rebbe's father was a genius. He could talk to a simple person. He could talk to a great intellectual. He could talk to a great rabbi. He could talk to a great Kabbalist. And on a personal level, the degree of success that they had in this position of Rabbonus and Yekaterinoslav was extraordinary. But the challenges that they faced were formidable. Were a, a, a smaller person, a lesser person, could never have dealt with those challenges. In the beginning, it was simply the challenges of Tsarist Russia, which was very anti-Semitic. There were all kinds of limitations on Jews, and so on and so forth. But by the end of the decade, by the 1917, 18, and so on, there was the Bolshevik Revolution, and Adablevik was facing uh, a government that was officially dedicated to the eradication of religion altogether, and certainly the eradication of Judaism, of Yiddishkeit. And he stood like a rock. The Rebbe's father stood like a rock. He wouldn't budge, he wouldn't compromise, he wouldn't even shy away. He was outspoken in his, in his position. The Jewish people have to hold on to their traditions. He would say what the previous Rebbe used to say often, that it's not against the law to teach children Torah, it's not against the law to go to Shul, it's not against the law to practice Yiddishkeit. There were just certain restrictions. And Eblevik was a rock, literally a rock. Thousands of people uh, leaned on him. And this was the Rebbe's chinuch, this was the Rebbe's education. So his very, very early years were spent in a, a spiritual or a Hasidic cocoon, if you will, 
By the time he was seven or eight, that was over. They moved to a very big city. Their parents, his parents and his brother's parents were very, very involved in a community that was very, very large and very dynamic and very diverse and very political. <clears throat> and then they had the pressures from outside, the pressures from the government, and they had to sustain, they had to nourish and to sustain and to feed that community. They did it with incredible success. And the Rebbe would occasionally, as a Rebbe, reference those early years. There have been occasions where the Rebbe would say very passionately, I was the son of a Rav in Soviet Russia, and I was the oldest son of a Rav which meant that I was the, the first person that was turned to if my father wasn't available. And on many occasions, said that ever, I was called in for cross-examination, for interrogation by the, whatever they call themselves, the NKVD, the Cheka Guard, the, the KGB, they keep changing their names, but it's the same people and the same philosophy, uh, to answer for the way my father was doing his role, function as a Rav. And the Rebbe said once publicly, and if I wasn't afraid of them, I'm not afraid of you. Someone had threatened. Someone had threatened the Rebbe. So the Rebbe very emotionally announced, um, I fa faced down the Soviets and I wasn't afraid of them. And if I wasn't afraid of them, I wasn't afraid of you. So in a real way, the Rebbe's upbringing uh, was modern. You know, the, the Rebbe's upbringing in a real way is in concert with the Rebbe ship that the Rebbe would have to himself uh, endure and continues to endure. Um, very untraditional. The Rebbe's Hasidic Rebbe role is completely outside the mold of a Hasidic Rebbe and certainly outside the mold of a Chabad Hasidic Rebbe, which, believe it or not, Chabad, the old Chabad Hasidus, is the most insular. It's the most to itself of any Hasidic group. And here Chabad done literally a, a 180, a complete reversal, where Rebbe has become the most uh, a popular Rebbe, almost populist Rebbe, you know, everybody's Rebbe, concerned with education of children and with mikvah tara, with the uh, family purity and bringing, bringing Jewish children into the world, that they should be kosher Jewish children and they should get a kosher education and they should grow up and they shouldn't graduate from Judaism when they turn 12 and 13, but they should be raised to be Jews with pride and with faith. The Rebbe became a Rebbe who was very, very much involved in the modern world. And you could make a case that that's how he was raised. He grew up in that kind of a home. Um, the city where his father served as Rav was an incredibly modern city. It was very complicated. And the Rebbe's parents did a lot to, to sustain Yiddishkeit, to keep it going, to keep people aware and proud and involved in their tradition with great self-sacrifice. And the Rebbe lived this as a child, and then as a teenager, and then as an adult, and so on and so forth. Um, I just want to say a few things more about the Rebbe, and then I'll, I'll go back to the Rebbe's father. Um, the Rebbe had two brothers, and the three of them were geniuses. Were, I mean, geniuses, within the realm of geniuses, they were geniuses, extraordinary minds. And in a house that was a very busy home, there was all kinds of people coming and going. Each one of them had their own separate bedroom with three little rooms that Ebba's mother arranged this before the revolution. After the revolution, they took away half their apartment. But when they first moved, the Ebba's parents arranged that each one of the boys would have their own little room. And they would sit, each one of them, in their room, studying Taita day and night. The Ebba's mother used to say, I had to fight with my boys to eat. She had to fight with her boys they should stop studying it. Hasmada, the diligence in that house was out of this world. <clears throat> Pardon me. So uh, as, as the Rebbetson would explain it, the house was very busy, but the boys were very isolated. The Rebbe and his brothers, for the most part, were not busy with the activities of their home. They were busy studying day and night. Things would change later on, and there were certain cases where they very, very clearly went out of that paradigm, but by and large, that Eben and his brothers sat and studied and they're in their own little world, and like there was nothing else going on in the world. And there's a wonderful piece, a wonderful piece written by a Jew, I just saw it last year, two years ago, whose name is Yeshaya Shor. 
Yeshayashar Yeshay was a Zionist. He was a big machet in Israel. He was not a religious man, but he was a childhood friend of the Rebbe's brother. And he wrote a wonderful expose. It's mostly about the Rebbe's brother, who called, he calls Leib, Label, Yisrael Leib. Um, but there's many references to our Rebbe. And amongst the things that he writes about our Rebbe was that there were the three boys. But the oldest was called Rav Tzair. The oldest was called the junior rabbi. Nobody said about the other two boys that they were junior rabbis. But the oldest son, he was just a few years older than his brothers, was seen as separate from his brothers, in spite of the fact that all three of them were extraordinary minds, great genius. The Rebbe was called, as a very young man, the, Rafta, the junior rabbi. He was treated with a different kind of respect than his brothers were. And he tells, this Yeshaya Shah tells some wonderful stories. And one of the stories he tells is that the Rebbe was very involved in astronomy as a teenager. And he was self-taught. He never went to school. Everything he knew, he taught himself. <clears throat> the Rebbe's mother used to say that my son had no formal education and professors, professors would come discuss with him mathematics and physics. And the ironic thing was that people used to come to the Rebbe in Russia in those days, he was a teenager, to help them with languages. He was an expert at languages. One of the languages the Rebbe learned as a teenager was English. And people whose job it was to teach English would consult with this uneducated boy about the nuance of English, of English language. But anyway, the Rebbe was very into astronomy. And um, he had all kinds of tables of uh, celestial bodies, extracelestial bodies on his walls. And he came to his group of friends. He didn't hang around much, but he said to his friends that on this and this day, there's going to be an eclipse, a solar eclipse, a, a lunar eclipse, kind of like, an eclipse of the sun by the moon. And the day came and the day went and there was no eclipse. And then he was a bit disappointed. And the boys, his friends, his his cheering committee were discussing the fact that the Rebbe had made a mistake. And they all agreed that there's no way the young, the young rabbi made a mistake. It was underreported or it was missed. But if the Rebbe had predicted a, an eclipse, a solar eclipse, then there was a solar eclipse. A few days later, the Rebbe came with a newspaper that there had been an eclipse and that it was seen in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. He was vindicated. And his friends, some of his friends were not even religious, uh, knew that if this young boy predicted that there would be a, an eclipse, they knew there's no way that, that, that there was a possibility that that could be incorrect. <coughs> anyway, that's a little bit about that, Ebbe. Oh, oh, uh, one more thing. Two more things. The Rebbe is a Rebbe. He's a Chabad Hasidic Rebbe. So from, in his very core burns a fire of Hasidism. As a little child, one of the few occasions that the Rebbe would go out of his, his solitude, where he would sit and study, was Yutas Kislev. Yutas Kislev, the 19th day in the month of Kislev, of course, is the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidus. And each year, the Rebbe would gather all the children, children I mean nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds, and they would all contribute 10 kopecks and five kopecks and 20 kopecks and 15 kopecks, and they would buy the delicacies, nash, and they would have a child's fabrengen. The children amongst themselves would have a fabrengen. This kiss of the Rebbe would organize this every year. It was one of those uh, circumstances where the Rebbe showed his true character even as a child. And another event, which is very, very important, um, there's, there's actually two events that are worth mentioning. Uh, one of them was that there was a, uh, an epidemic of typhus around 1918, that was 16 years old. And uh, it was a contagion, um, not dissimilar to what we're experiencing now. And uh, the consequence of that was that there was quarantine. Anybody who was uh, infected with this illness was isolated and put into a house and then he would be visited every day by a doctor. And if you lived, you lived. And if you died, you died. And it was incredibly difficult because apparently it is a very painful illness. And the Rebbe closed his books and he risked his own life, went from bed to bed, uh, easing the pain and the suffering of, of the people who had this uh, illness of typhus. And the Rebbe got sick himself. He was healing others. He would, I, I don't know all the details of it. I've heard this you have to clean the tongue of the person. It is a, it's very unpleasant. 
And the Rebbe was, as a boy, he was a teenager himself, closed his Gemara, and he went from bed to bed helping people with this illness, and he himself became affected with the illness. I heard that the Rebbe lost his hair at that age. So the Rebbe's mother related that while the Rebbe was ill, he was in a state of delirium for a period. In other words, he was speaking in what appeared to be incoherent words. So she says, the Rebbe's mother related that if you would lean over and listen to what her son was saying, he was muttering and he was mumbling uh, that God Almighty has created a great world with many layers and many levels and many realms and that this, the world we live in, is the lowest and the darkest. And that all of the higher realms exist only to serve a Jew on this earth, doing a physical mitzvah, uh, on this, the lowest of all planes. In other words, that Rebbe, as a teenager, already was focused on how his, his philosophy, that the most important thing is the action, and the action that we do here, on the physical level, there's all kinds of esoteric and spiritual uh, depth to Yiddishkeit, to our faith, to our religion. But in the end, it comes down to a physical act done by a physical person in a physical body in this physical earth. That's the reason why God Almighty created everything. That's one episode where the Rebbe went out of his isolation. And another, and this is a very important event, and this is well documented at this point, documented at this point, is when the refugees arrived. At the end of the First World War, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of Jews arrived uh, from the front uh, to the city of Yekaterinoslav. Um, if you're familiar with the history of Europe and Jews, whenever there was a war, neither side trusted the Jews. So Jews were not allowed to live on, in a border town or near a border. And of course, in war, the borders are, are plastic. They're fluid, they're constantly moving. And any time the border would move, the Jews had to move. And there were arrests, and there were kidnappings. It was a disaster. And tens of thousands of Jews arrived in Yekaterinoslav. Now, the community was large, but it was like the community doubling in size. The, the, the number of immigrants was equal to or perhaps even greater than the number of Jews that lived there. And the Rebbe said, I'd never seen my mother like this. My mother, the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Sinchana, the Rebbe Leibich's wife, took the bull by the horns, and she led a committee of committees to provide all of the needs for all of these refugees, housing, clothing, food, education, medicine. <clears throat> and it was all done honorably. It was all done in a way that made the people feel very respected. And the Rebbe said, I knew my mother, but I had never seen such enthusiasm, such vigor, such energy as I saw during that period. And during that period, and like I said, this is documented by very secular Jews, the Rebbe and his brothers closed their Gemaras. They were, how old could they have been? 16, 17 years old. And they engaged fully in helping these refugees. And these are two examples of the Rebbe's, so to speak, going out of his solitude and and uh, lifting other people up when the circumstance called for it. Um, I, I happened to have a story which is a little bit close to me personally. My, my father-in-law's name was Reb Moshe Nemenov, Allah Shalom. His father was a big chassid, whose name was Reb Nissen Nemenov. And uh, this is a true story. It's well known, but uh, I did not know that it happened to Reb Nissen. That Reb Nissen Nemenov was a boy. And he arrived in Yekaterinoslav, the city where the Rebbe's parents lived, to raise money for Tem Khatim, to raise money for the yeshiva. This was the practice in those days. That when you wanted to raise funds for the yeshiva, you would send a model of the yeshiva, one of the boys, to raise funds. So Rab Nissen came to Yekaterinoslav, to where the Rebbe's parents lived. I think he stayed in their home. And uh, he raised money for Tem Khatim. So naturally, he asked the rabbi to help him with the, the fundraising. He was, after all, a Lubavitcher Chosset. He also asked the Rebbe and his brother to assist. So the Rebbe's brother, his name was Yisrael Ayaleib, or Leib, Label, accompanied this young boy, Rebbe Nissen. They were about the same age. From house to house to raise money for the yeshiva. The Rebbe, who was a little bit older, said to this Rebbe Nissen, I'm busy, I don't have time, but I'm going to give you a letter. And you go meet one man, and you'll get a, a donation from him for the yeshiva. So Rebbe Nissen went to this person with the note from the Rebbe, 
And this person gave him a larger donation than all of the funds he raised with all the help of that Rebbe's brother, just from that one person. But just a, a window into how the Rebbe operates. Now let's go back a little bit and talk about the Rebbe's father, whose birthday is today, I just want to insert, parenthetically, that uh, the Rebbe has a custom, the Rebbe had a custom, has a custom, that on Pesach, he would meet with the children. It would be a rally for the children during one day of Chalamoyed. The kids would gather in 770, and the Rebbe would speak to them on a mic. They'd be singing and so on. The Rebbe would give them times. And whenever it was possible, the Rebbe would arrange that this meeting between himself and the children would take place on his father's birthday. It would take place on the 18th day of the month of this Nisan, which of course was the Rebbe's birthday. And it, the Rebbe didn't always talk about his father. In fact, he didn't talk about him much on that occasion. But it was clear that the Rebbe was singling out this day because to him personally, today was a special day. It was his father's birthday and it was the day of his bris. So we'll talk a bit about the Rebbe's father. The Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levick, was an incredibly great miyuchas. He had a great genealogy. He, was a very, he came from a very, very uh, special family. He was a shnerson. And uh, the name sp speaks for itself. And he came from a particularly illustrious branch of the Schneerson family. <coughs> and there's a very interesting story, a very, very interesting story, which relates to the Rebbe also, about this branch of the family. The third Chabad Rebbe, the third Lubavitch Rebbe, whose name also was Menachem Mendel, the Tzemach Tzedek, had seven sons, seven sons. One of them predeceased him, passed away before him, which left six sons. Of those six, five became Rebbes. Five took up the mantle of Hasidic Rebbeship in one city or another in Russia or in the Ukraine. In other words, when the Tzemach Tzedek, when the third Lubavitch had passed away, Lubavitch was splintered into four groups, or five groups, and each one of the brothers went to a different city and opened up his own version of what was Chabad Hasidus. And some of these groups lasted 50 years from whatever, 1826 until World War I, really. And they all, so to speak, collapsed. And whatever was left of them found its way back into Lubavitch. The only one of the Tzemach Tzedek's sons who did not become a Rebbe when his father passed away was the oldest. And the oldest name was Rebbe Sholem, Ravash, Rebbe Sholem. Now, according to Jewish law and according to Jewish tradition, and certainly according to Hasidic tradition, the oldest son has, has the first right to succession. If a person has many sons, and he's a man of prominence or power or influence, and he, he passes away, if the oldest son is worthy, he takes, them, he takes his father's position. Of all the Tzemach Tzedek's children, the one who would not uh, take a Rebbe ship was the one who was most entitled to it, the oldest. And it was very odd, it was very strange that of all the seven sons, the oldest would not become a Rebbe. And he would tell his family the following. Ravash would tell his children that the Tzemach Tzedek, his father had said to him, I'm asking you not to become a Rebbe. I'm asking you not to accept a post as a Hasidic master, even though you're entitled to it. And I promise you that if you don't take the position of Hasidic master, you'll get Pishnai, you'll get a double measure, a double portion. Um, according to Jewish law, which uh, for those of us who are learning, Peregach, Rabbi Yehim, and Rambam, it happens to me that Rambam are learning these days, a Bchar, a firstborn, is entitled to two portions of the estate. In other words, if a man passes away and leaves five children, you don't divide the estate into five, you divide the estate into six. And the oldest gets double. It's two portions, which would mean a third of the estate. So the Reb Tzemach Tzedek said to the Ravash, do not become a Rebbe, and I promise you, you'll get your double, your double portion. And then he added cryptically, he said in a hint, which means in four generations it'll come back to you. So in the Rebbe's patrilineal ancestry, there was a tradition, it was known, 
that in four generations, the leadership of Lubavitch would come back to this branch of the family. And that Avash told this to his son, whose name was Levi Yitzchak. <coughs> Pardon me, Levi Yitzchak told this to his son, whose name was Rebbe Rakshne Zalman, who then told it to his son, who was the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levik. So Rebbe Levik, who was a giant of Torah, and he was a master Kabbalist, felt that he was entitled to the mantle of Rebbeship because the Tzermach Tzedek had said four generations before that in four generations they come back to the family. But he, he, was, he was not Zayich, it didn't happen. The previous Rebbe became the Rebbe. And when the Rebbe was engaged to be married to the previous Rebbe's middle daughter, Rebbe Levik said, now I understand that the four generations have to be counted from the next generation, not from the generation before. And the Rebbe, the, the Tzermach Tzedek had foretold, in other words, Five generations before, it was already predetermined that the Rebbe was destined to be a Rebbe. And the family knew this tradition. The family knew this tradition. And when the Rebbe was engaged to be married to the previous Rebbe, when our Rebbe was engaged to be married to the previous Rebbe's daughter, they said, oh, this is the, the realization. This is the fulfillment. This is the fruition of this prophecy. And I want you to know that the Rebbe's father would often get into trouble uh, with Lubavitcher Hasidim, because every Chassid believes that his Rebbe is going to live forever. Every Chassid believes that his Rebbe is Mashiach. There's no other way. And Rebbe Leivik, the Rebbe's father, would meet Lubavitcher Hasidim. He would tell them, I'm the Mechutin. I'm, 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 I, I share children with your Rebbe, and I'm the father of your next Rebbe. And to Hasidim, that was like the worst thing anybody could say, but Rebbe Leivik was very proud of his son, and um, he would unabashedly announce to anybody that who would listen, and even if they wouldn't listen, that the, my son is the son of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and that he's the next Lubavitcher Rebbe. He was very proud of his son, he was very, very proud of the Rebbe, and he anticipated that the Rebbe would become a Rebbe, which of course is exactly how it played out. So Rebbe Levi Yitzchak, Rebbe Levik, or Levik as he was called in Lubavitch, was a big miyuchas, came from a very prominent family. His father was a giant of Torah and Hasidus and Avodah Hashem, as was his grandfather and his great-grandfather. And the Rebbe's father also was a giant of Torah and Hasidus. Um, but he's unique. He's unique. He's unique because of his incredibly um, prolific writings in Kabbalah. You know, in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, there were not that many people who you could call, you know, die-in-the-wood Kabbalists, people who truly were Kabbalists. And the Rebbe's father was absolutely in that ilk. He was very, very unique. That in addition to all the Torah scholarship that he had and the expertise at Talmud and Halacha and Jewish law, he was an extraordinary Kabbalist, an extraordinary Kabbalist. Most, most of his writings are lost, and it's conceivable that at least some of them have been destroyed. Uh, they occasionally find things from the Rebbe's father, even now, and they publish them. But the Rebbe's father was an incredibly prolific writer, unbelievably so. And he writes in code. His, his style of writing is pages and pages and pages, but it's not readable material. Every line you have to study like it's a book, because it's written very cryptically. And if, if, if those writings had been written in longhand, they wouldn't be a book, they'd be an encyclopedia. His, his writings in Kabbalah and his knowledge of Kabbalah um, really set him apart, even during his lifetime, when there were many great uh, rabbonim, great rabbis and scholars, that Levik stood out because of his extraordinary, an extraordinary knowledge of Kabbalah. <clears throat> and the, the way he expounded on it, so I, I, a couple of things I want to share about this particular aspect of the Rebbe's father's proficiency in Kabbalah. The first thing I want to say has to do with his Rebbe, with the Rebbe Rashab, whose name was Reb Shalom Deiber, the fifth Chabad Rebbe. The fifth Chabad Rebbe would say, and it's published in his sikhs, in his talks, he would say, quote, I have a hand in Kabbalah, a hand in Kabbalah. And there's a story attached to it. Why the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth of the Rebbe, would say, When he was a little boy, four or five, 
his grandfather, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, who's, like I said before, his name was also Menachem Mendel, picked up this little grandson of his, who was destined to be a Rebbe, put him on his lap, and he took his little hand, and he began to brush it through his beard, to brush it through his beard, to comb it through his beard. And the Zayde, the grandfather, took his grandson's little fingers, and he stroked them through his beard for a period of time, and disentangled all the hairs that may have been knotted. And at a certain point, he said in Yiddish, and I'll translate it to English, of course, he said, Subersht, Subersht, Dachtzach Subersht, Nadir Ayad in Kabbalah. And in English, this means, did you disentangle all the knots? Did you clarify all the confusion? Did you separate all the entanglements? And he spoke rhetorically. He spoke to himself. He was a little kid. And he said, I think you did. And then he said in Yiddish, Nadir, I'm giving you a hand in Kabbalah. In other words, it was a mystical gift that the great Semach Tzedek gave his young grandson, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe. And the Rebbe Rashab would say about himself, I have a hand in Kabbalah, referencing this episode that had occurred when he was a very little boy with his grandfather. And the Rebbe Rashab shared this proficiency in Kabbalah with a few. The Rebbe Rashab taught Hasidus, and the Hasidus of the Rebbe Rashab is a discussion for a different Fabrengen, because you can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. But the Kabbalah he shared with a select group of his disciples, and that's the right word, disciples. You know, he had many Hasidim, and he had a few Talmidim. Amongst the individuals whom the Rebbe Rashab shared his proficiency in Kabbalah was the Rebbe's father. Reb Leivik, or Leivik, as Hasidim called him affectionately. And people would say to the Rebbe's father, how do you know so much? <laughs> you could talk, you turn them on, you turn on a spigot, they just wouldn't turn off. Would just, you could talk for five, six hours. In, in a, <clears throat> the story was that in the city of Yekaterinslav, there were not a lot of Jews who were expert in Hasidists, let alone in Kabbalah. And the Rebbe's father would talk and talk and talk and talk. And at some point, somebody would say to him, Rabbi, who are you talking to? Nobody has a clue what you're talking about. And he would say, the young man in the back understands every single word, referring to our Rebbe, who was the boy of 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. His, 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 his proficiency in Kabbalah and the way he was prolific about writing it and, and, and uh, exp uh, uh, expounding on it was, was like a fountain. It was extraordinary. So somebody once asked him, how do you know all this? And how could you possibly have this much information? So he answered, I was taught. Meaning the Rebbe Rashab, his Rebbe had taught him um, Kabbalah. So the question then came and said, if we add up all the minutes you spent in Lubavitch, it wouldn't amount to the amount of Kabbalah you teach. So Rebbe Leivik said in Yiddish, Klolim. Menat Meribigi Geben Klolim which means principles. I was given the rules of how to expound on mysticism, on Kabbalah. Now I have my own proficiency, my own expertise. <coughs> Pardon me. And the Rebbe's father was like a fountain, like a fountain of Kabbalah. And it made him, it really set him apart from even the greatest of sages of his time. And, and the, I guess the culmination of this, the, the ultimate expression of this uniqueness is the following. That his Rebbe, the Blavik's Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, said that when Mashiach comes, I'm going to take three of my disciples, three of my Hasidim, I'm going to take them by the arm, and I'm going to introduce them to Mashiach, and I'm going to tell him, I want you to meet my prodigies, I want you to meet my products, I want you to meet my disciples. And the, the three, we know who they were. One was a Chosib by the name of Reb Mendel Chain who was a, an unbelievable genius in, in, in Talmud and Halacha. He, he was murdered in 1918 in Nezhin, where he was rov. He was a very young man, and he was a, an incredibly great gon and chassid. The second was a yid by the name of Rav Zalman Shneis of Lodz, who was a great Kabbalist. And the third was the Rebbe's father, who was great in, what is it, the exos exoteric and the esoteric, in the revealed Torah and in the secret Torah. And the Rebbe's father really was, he really was a favorite, a favorite of the Rebbe Rashab, of the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. And they had a very, very close relationship. They worked together on many projects. The Rebbe Rashab got him a job. 
By the way, just to give you an example of somebody that the Rebbe's father was very involved with, during the Bayless blood libel, which took place in, was it 1912, I think, 1911, 1912, the famous Mendel Bayless, the last blood libel uh, that took place in Russia. So the accusation was that Jews don't use blood for matzahs. But the Hasidim do. The people involved in Kabbalah do. And the Rebbe Rashab, the Fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, was very, very involved in that uh, story. And the Rebbe's father was recruited to do the research and provide the information on the Kabbalah side to show how ludicrous, how ridiculous it was that someone should say that the Jewish people who follow Kabbalah drink blood. And I need to tell you a story, and I'm not going to tell it correctly, but it's just, it's such a delicious story. It's worth telling, even though it has no context. The, the, the Jewish world in Russia was taken completely by surprise by this blood libel. I mean, Russia was anti-Semitic. <clears throat> you know, but blood libels happened in the Dark Ages, you know, in medieval times. It didn't happen in, quote, the modern world. And the entire Jewish world was awakened. And it was a very dangerous time because non-Jews didn't need much of a reason to kill Jews and the opportunity was there. The government almost sanctioned it. And now there was a Jew accused of killing a, a Christian child and using his blood for matzahs. Last thing the Jewish people needed. The, the attorney... The attorney, I think his name was Ginsburg, but I could be wrong, was a very secular Jew. He was not a religious man at all. But he worked in close consultation with the great rabbis of Russia at the time, including the Rebbe Rashab, including the, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, who was the teacher, the master of our Rebbe's father, Rebbe Yitzchak Shneers. And at one point during their conversations, he asked him a personal favor. He said to him, when you do your summation at the end of the trial, cross-examination, and then each side gets to make a summation. He says, when you do your summation, I'm asking you that you should finish, finish with Shema Yisrael Adinoya Lehein Adinoya Echad. And this very secular Jew in open court, the whole of Russia, was following the proceedings, did as he was asked. He finished defending Mandel Bayless and demonstrating how ridiculous it all was. And the last words out of his mouth were, Shema Yisrael Adinoy Elhein Adnechad. It's a true story. And it's, uh, it's, it's good to tell. It's good to tell always, especially in, in a time like now. So the Rebbe's father had uh, much merit of his own. Had much, much merit of his own. Um, as I explained to you, he became the Rav at a, at a pretty young age. He was 31 years old. He became Rav of in, a, in a big city. And um, there was a lot of politics. It was not an easy ascension to the Rabonis. There were every group within that community wanted to appoint a Rav of their liking. The Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, was my Senefish, really put his life on the line that the Rav should be a Lubavitcher. The Rav in Yekatinus had always been a Lubavitcher going back four generations. And the Rebbe wanted, the Rebbe Rashab wanted very much that there should be a new, the, the previous Rav had been a Lubavitcher and he wanted that the new Rav should also be a Lubavitcher and he worked very hard to uh, see to it that the Rebbe should become the Rav. And one of the things which has been revealed recently, in the last few years, is that the opponents of the appointment of the Rebbe's father as Rav had many explanations or arguments why he shouldn't get the position. And one of them was that he only had smiche from friendly rabbis. He had smiche from Hasidic rabbis. And the argument was, let him go to a real rabbi who's going to give him a tough quiz, a tough test, and let him take a real test, and then we'll determine if he's really qualified to be the Rav. So the Rebbe's father had to go and meet some of the greatest misnagdim, that means opponents of Hasidus in Russia at the time, and to take, take out smiche for Rabbi, to be tested and to get a smiche that he's qualified to be Rav. And he, he passed with fine colors. I mean, the Rebbe's father was an incredible mind. One of the people he needed to get smicha from was the Chaim Salavechik, the Briskerov, who is known in the yeshiva world as the Chaim. He was a giant of Torah. And the truth of the matter was, was a, he was a Masnaget, but he was a giant of Hasidus. That's the real truth of the matter. He was a very, very special man. And he and the Rebbe Rashab had a personal friendship that was, it, it had no equal. 
the Rebbe Rashab was the leader of the Hasidim, the Chaim was the leader of the Misnagdim, and they're not supposed to love each other, and these two men absolutely loved each other and had such mutual respect. Their relationship was really very, very special. And the Rebbe Rashab had said to his disciples, said to his pupil, go to Rebbe Chaim and get smicha. I'll write him, I'll write him a letter uh, encouraging him to give you the smicha. And then, in the course of the correspondence, this is printed in a new volume of letters of the Rebbe Rashab, which was printed in the last three or four years. They found these letters someplace in Russia. These letters were not known about. And at one point, the Rebbe Rashab writes to Rebbe Levik, I have not had an opportunity to write to Rebbe Chaim about the smicha, because I can't just write to him about the smicha. I need uh, a pretense. I need some kind of other context that I use this idea. He says, but go, go to Brisk, he'll give you the smicha, and the Rebbe Rashab adds, because he's a really God-fearing man, and when he'll meet you, and he'll see that you're a really God-fearing man, the fact that you're a chassid, and that he's a mesnaget, will play no role, and he'll give you the smicha. Now, when the revolution happened, and this, by the way, this is very timely, because we're celebrating the Rebbe's father's birthday, which is today, what people may not be aware of is that nine days ago, the ninth of Nisan, is the day that the Rebbe's father was arrested in 1939. He would serve five years in exile, which included the prison term of about six months. That would literally kill him. Literally kill him. He came out of prison in 1904, right before Pesach. He was only 64 years old. He was an incredibly physically fit man physically strong and handsome and tall, and they destroyed him. He came out of his exile, a broken man, and he passed away uh, some five months later. So the timing of this Fabrengen speaks to the Rebbe's birthday, it speaks to the Rebbe's bris, it speaks to the Rebbe's father's birthday, but it also speaks to the fact that the Rebbe's father was arrested on the ninth day in the month of Nissan in the year 1939. And, and I want to tell you this first. Um, the Rebbe's father was one of the most outspoken Abonim in Russia. It, it could be said that when the previous Rebbe left Russia in 1927, the Rebbe's father became the de facto leader of the Jewish community in Russia. And like, his, like the previous Rebbe, he led from the front. He, he never shied away from saying what he thought and what he felt. Very outspoken. And the government didn't like it. And yet, he survived for almost 20 years. I mean, the Bolshevik Revolution happened in 1917, right? It probably came to Yekaterinoslav around 1920, right? And Leningrad is the very top of Russia, northern Russia, and Yekaterinoslav is the very south of Russia. And it took a few years for that revolution and that civil war to push its way south until it would occupy all of Russia, including Yekaterinoslav. But he survived till 1939. Most Rabbonim were incarcerated in the 20s. And the Rebbe's father endured. And there's a lot of reasons that we know, that we understand why the Rebbe's father managed to last so long under the Soviets before they finally, so to speak, had enough and arrested him and put him in jail and threw away the key. And one of them is his friends. I, I explained to you earlier that the Rebbe's parents were incredibly loved people personally. And they were involved with the entire Jewish community, including communists and uh, very, very outspoken opponents of religion. They didn't like God. They didn't like Tefillin. They didn't like Shabbos. They didn't like kosher. They didn't like matzah. They didn't like mikveh. But they loved Rebbe Leivik personally. And many a time, someone would come to the house in the evening and say to the Rebbe's mother, tell your husband that he shouldn't sleep at home tonight. So he would go to sleep someplace else and at two o'clock in the morning, the KGB would come and knock on the door and he was fortuitously not home. This happened multiple times, many times. And um, that's one of the little aspects of why he managed to last as long as he did. In addition to his prominence and his, he was a public figure. It wasn't easy just to lock him up. Uh, why he lasted until 1939. Now, why was he arrested right before Pesach? And the answer is because he was a thorn in the eye of the Soviets over matzah. The Rebbe's father, the Blavik, dedicated his life, he actually sacrificed his life for a kosher piece of matzah. And every year, 
he would go to battle with the powers that were in, in Soviet Russia at the time to be given kosher flour. Flour in Russia was all bleached. Bleached flour is chametz. It's unfit. And you have to get flour which has not been bleached, which is very difficult to get. And every year, the Rebbe's father, months in advance, would petition the government that needs to have kosher flour. And he would send mashgichim overseers to make sure that the flour was done the way he wanted it, and so on and so forth. And every year there was a fight, and every year they would threaten him that he's costing the people, the government, money, and therefore he could be punished, he can even lose his life, and he would not back down. Well, one year, he finally got his flour, and it was shipped in a train car that had a leak, and it rained. And all the kosher flour became completely unfit. And Ablavik asked for a second batch, and this was too much. And the Soviets fought him tooth and nail, and they threatened him, and they did everything they could to tell him, to, you know, just say it's kosher. You know, who's going to know? You know? <laughs> Some people think that kosher is the rabbi blessing the food. The food has to be non-kosher food. You can give 100 blessings. It's not kosher. And uh, some people just say it's kosher. Who's going to know and who's going to care? And I believe it cared. And he went all the way to Kalinin. Kalinin was the president of the Soviet Union, who was a, he was a very interesting man. He was an enigma. He was a strange man. But he had a good heart. And Kalinin, I remember the Rebbe telling the story of Fabregen. Kalinin wrote a note announcing that the government of Russia has to provide flour. The government wanted a Blazik stamp of approval because then all the Jews in Russia would use it. This was owned by the government. And this was revenue for them. That's when they were so interested in having his, right. him uh, proving it, which is why, which is why, they, which, 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 which is even why he was in the picture altogether. Why would they even take him, would take uh, him seriously? Because uh, they, they needed his action. And all of the grain was actually uh, grown. Very, Around in in, in Ukraine, <coughs> in Ukraine, yeah, very good, yeah, very good point, very important point. He went getting back to my point. He went all the way to Kalinin, and he got Kalinin to write a note that the government has to provide new flour under the oversight of the Mashgichim, of that means the the people who are representing Rabbi Schneerson, and that it should be done to his specifications. And they were up in arms. They were so angry that he got away with this, so to speak. And the end of the story was that right before Pesach, he was arrested. And there's no question that his arrest had to do with this incessant battle over matzah. Now, the Rebbe, our Rebbe, told the story about the matzahs many times. There were certain stories that Rebbe would repeat frequently. And the story about the matzah and his father, he would repeat more than once or twice. And on one occasion, the Rebbe made the following observation. There are 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. Why did my father dedicate his life and sacrifice his life of all the mitzvahs, dafke for matzah, specifically for matzah? And the Rebbe said that my father understood that it wasn't realistic in that Soviet Union for all the Jewish people to practice all the mitzvahs. It was too difficult. The pressure was too great. The threats, the fear, the, the uh, terror was too great and that many Jews would succumb to the challenges and give up their religion. But he wanted at least every Jew should have kosher matzah. Because the Zoya says that matzah has to do with faith. It's called Michal Eminus, the bread of faith. And the Rebbe said, My father sacrificed his life for matzah because he wanted at least the faith of the Jew should be pure and should be healthy and should be the way it's supposed to be. And parenthetically, when we're talking about matzah, the Zoya also says that matzah has to do with healing, with the food. And uh, Hashem should help us all. We eat a kazayis matzah. And it should make us all well and protect us all from chas v'shom and our families and especially our seniors from any uh, ill uh, effects associated with the illness that we're currently um, all dealing with. But mystically, spiritually, healing is tshuva. Healing is the idea of tshuva, of a person who may have gone off the correct path to return. So matzah encompasses faith which keeps us, and Manse encompasses the idea that a person can always come back. And the Rebbe's father was finally arrested. He was put in jail. And for months, his wife didn't know where he was. They sent him from prison to prison. She went looking for him. She brought him several pounds of matzahs. 
and she brought it to the prison and they wouldn't tell him if her husband was there. They actually gave him the matzah, but they, they didn't have the decency of telling his wife where he was and it took her months to track him down. They tortured, the Rebbe's father was tortured, was tortured, was tortured severely. You know, one of the saddest commentaries on the Rebbe's father's life is that somebody brought the Rebbe a photograph of his father. Someone brought the Rebbe a, photo, a picture of his own father. And he asked his mother, Ved is thus. He asked his mother, who's this? And she said, this is, the tata, this is your father. And the Rebbe didn't believe her. He had changed so much, he didn't recognize his own father. On the back of the photo, you can see the Rebbe wrote with his own handwriting, my father with a question mark. He did not recognize his father in the photo that was taken after he was released from prison in exile because they absolutely destroyed him. They tortured him. They tortured him. He was a giant of a Jew and they sucked the life out of him. Six months he was in many prisons and he was being cross-examined and then he was being tried and then they sent him off to exile for five years and the exile was retroactive from the beginning of the arrest, which is why he went out of exile also right before Pesach. And he was moved, it was illegal, it was in the middle of the war, but some people were my Nefesh. Uh, they moved him to the nearest Jewish community, which was in the city of al which is also in Kazakhstan, which where he spent the last few months of his life where he actually passed away. And I'm just gonna finish with one more story about the Rebbe's father. Um, that has to do with his, the very, very end of his life. Um, 11 days before he died was Tisha B'Av, the fast of the ninth of Av, all the Jewish people fast for the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And there was a family, a Lubavitcher Chabad family living in Yekaterinoslav called Raskin. And they sent their older son, he was a teenager, a boy of 18 or so, to Reblevik and his wife to bring them food to far fast and up fast, and food to have before the fast and after the fast. So the Nebulevich was very ill. The Rebbe's father was terribly, terribly, terribly ill. He was near death. And this boy rolls into the house with food for him and his wife for the, meal, the meals before the fast and after the fast. And the Nebulevich calls over this young boy and starts talking, Kabbalah, <laughs> Kabbalah. His, I think his name was Battle of Askin, Shalom Battle Askin. He didn't understand a single solitary word. And Ablavik is talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and does not stop. So his wife, the Rebbe Tzinchana, the Rebbe's mother, went over to him and said, you know, the fast is soon. We have to eat. He has to eat. Maybe he can interrupt this conversation and continue it at a different time. And Ablavik kept right on going. The Kabbalah just kept spewing at him. He talked for four or five hours. By the time he finished talking, it was the fast had already started. No one was able to eat. And this boy, Shalom Ben Askin, staggered out of the Rebbe's home, the Rebbe's father's home, drunk from all this Kabbalah, which he didn't understand much of. Anyway, he comes into his home. And his mother sees him, and she falls on his neck, and she's hugging him and kissing him, and she says, what happened? They had come from the Soviet army to take him to the front. Had they taken him to the front, he would never have come home. And Ablavik just occupied him, just kept him busy by talking Kabbalah. He didn't understand that, a word. Um, <laughs> and saved his life. This is just one of the great stories of Rablevik. And lastly, I want you to know, this is a Moiden de Kamaise. I heard the story from Baruch Aaron Hus, who heard the story from Beryl Shemtev, who heard the story from Simcha Gardetsky, Allah Hashem. Okay, I'm giving you the source. That Simcha Gardetsky, a great Lubavitcher Chosset, <coughs> was in the home of the Rebbe's father, Rablevik, in the 1930s. And the mail came. The mail came. And the Rebbe's father sifted through the mail. He picked up one letter. And he went, he put on his coat, his kapata, and his hat, and his gartel, his girdle that you wear special for prayer, to open the letter. Simcha Gardeski saw Rablevik do this. So he said to Rablevik, who is this letter from that you're making all of these sacred preparations you're putting on your coat and your hat and your gato. He says, it's a letter from my son. And Levik said, it's a letter from my son. So Rab Simcha says to him, a letter from your son, you have to get all dressed up and put on a hat and a coat. So Rab Levik said in Yiddish, and he would say this often, Rebbe's mother would say that my husband used to say, er hat mir lang that means he passed me long ago. Rab Levik was such a great 
gone, and such a great Makubu, and such a great Chassid, such a great Tzaddik. And he would say about his son, he passed me long ago. And it was to such an extent that when he would receive a letter from his son, he would get dressed up like receiving a letter from a Rebbe. This was the kind of reverence, respect, that the, Rebbe had, the Rebbe's father had for, for the Rebbe. And I'm just going to finish one more story, okay? One more story. Um, <laughs> you don't mind if I go on. Um, there was a Yid whose name was Nocham Shmar Yohu Sasonkin. That was his name. They call him Lubavitch Shmer Batumir. Batum, Batum is a city in Batum is a city in Kazakhstan, I believe, and in Gruzia, in Georgia. Batum is a city in Georgia. And he was a rabbi in Georgia. This Shmer Batumir was a big chosid, a very big chosid. And a very big Talmud Chochem was a very scholarly man, very learned man. And he had an experience with the Rebbe's mother which left him at a disadvantage. <clears throat> Pardon me, he was a yeshiva boy. Like I said before, they would send the yeshiva boys around to raise money for the yeshiva. So he came to Yekaterinoslav, he came to the Rebbe Petrovsk, and he knocked on the door of the apartment of the Rebbe's parents. The Rebbe's mother opens the door, and this boy, who was, he was a very special young man, but he was young, says to the Rebbe's mother in Yiddish, is Levik the, is Levik home, referring to the Rebbe's father as Levik. The Rebbe and Hannah looked at him like she could kill him. <laughs> Who do you think you are to call my husband Levik? At least the Rebbe Levik, the Rav, Rav Agon. She was very, very disturbed that a boy would refer to her husband just by the cavalier reference of Levik. And he said, Shmerel Batuma said, that she held a grudge for decades. For decades. Anytime she would see him, he could feel that she's still angry at him, that he dared call her husband Levik. Forty years later, Mamish, 40 years later, 35 years later, there was a yardside gathering in the Rebbe's mother's home for her husband. Every year she would make a gathering of Hasidim in her home for the yardside of her husband, of Levik. And uh, this Shmer of Atumer got himself an invitation to this Fabreng, and he came. He was now a sage, a senior chassid, and she still had that grudge. And during the proceedings, people would take turns saying things, and he asked permission to say something. And she said, sure, go ahead. So he began to say this. He said that in the Gemara, you have different categories of references to rabbis, to sages. The lowest reference is Rav. Rav, Reish Beis, Rav. If you came from Israel, it was a higher level of Rav, you were called Rebbe, Rebbe, with a Yud. And if you were the head of the Sanhedrin, even higher level of Rabbi, you were called Rabbon, with a Nun, like Rabbon Gamliel, and so on. And then the Gemara says, God will meet Rabban Shmei. There's Rav, there's Rebbe, there's Rabbon. But the greatest of the great did not have a rabbi as a prefix. They were simply called by their name. Hillel, Shammai, Abaye, Rav, and so forth. So Rabbi Sasonkin says, by Hasidim it was the same way. There's a Rav, and there's a Rebbe, and there's a Rabbi. But the greatest of Hasidim was so great, the only reference which was sufficient was simply to identify by the name. For example, the Rebbe's father was called Levik. <laughs> And he saw that the Rebbe's mother, you know, she was very aware of this grudge and that she had forgiven him because he had, he had explained why he referred to the Rebbe's father as late. Anyway, we're sitting in different rooms and it's, to me it's kind of fun to say, Chaim Levracha. Chaim Levracha, it was nice to sit with you. I, I can't see, I can only see the rabbi. I can't see who I'm talking to. Um, if you liked what I said, please visit Please, I beg you, visit my website, insidechasidus.org. I have many, many classes, and this is my business. I teach people chasidus. I'd love to gain some students. A good moyed, and Hashem should protect us all. Hashem should protect you, and your parents, and your grandparents. And we should always to the shleima. May all the brachas that you said be fulfilled, and the stories that you told find their way into our hearts. 
and inspire us <coughs> as they should and deserve to be. Amen. We want to be here now. So good. Amen. 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 So good, Davis. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So good, Davis. Good to know you. Amen. Amen. We want to be here now. Amen. Thank you all for joining, folks. And we'll be in touch uh, regarding, I'll put it out there. I want to get your feedback, Mashiach Sudha, what to do after, obviously after Yontif. So think about it and we'll see what, uh, what we decide. Be well, everyone. Yishakoyach. Thanks for joining. See you all tomorrow morning. Chzidus 9.20, Shachris 10 o'clock.